one of the most important lessons that I ever learned in life was in my early years in Weaverville, where I, I always thought that when you serve the Lord, God comes first, your family comes second, ministry comes third. In, in my case, ministry would be job, occupation, that sort of thing. You go on down this list. And I think it's a good list because it shows us uh, priorities. But I found it impossible for me to live because it's really hard to divide your time. And the best answer I found is that when God is number one, there is no number two. And that I actually get to love my wife as unto the Lord and he receives it personally. And when I take time with my children and my grandchildren, it is as unto the Lord. It's an offering to him because I'm doing what I was born to do. I'm doing what I was designed to do. A person who doesn't dream and has no desires is already dying. We, we, we keep alive. We actually prove, give evidence of life by the fact that we have a, a freedom and a liberty to dream. And the Lord in this passage is trying to draw us into a covenantal relationship where we don't let people who do wrong cause us to lose our peace, number one. Number two, we maintain that sense of presence. We dwell in that place of abiding in Christ. We feed ourselves on the history of God that we have and others have around us. It just means you sit down and you take time. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a happy meal. It's a, in, in the sense of something you just drive through, pick up, and gobble down. It's something you, you take time. Let it, let, it, let it impact who you are. Dwelling in the land, feeding on faithfulness, changes how you see. And if what you're feeding on doesn't change how you see, then you need to eat another meal. You need to go back to the faithfulness of the Lord again. Then it says, delight yourself in the Lord. Make sure that you find joy in your relationship with Jesus and make that your chief joy. In doing that, he's going to peer over your shoulder to find what caught your eye. He's going to find the things that actually bring delight to you. Why? Because as he fulfills them, because in his heart and mind, there's no separation between secular and sacred. There's no separation between natural and and spiritual, they're all inter interwoven. When he answers that flask thing for you, or he does that, you know, that just, just unreasonable, out of, the, out of the way dream that you had. It may be the slightest, smallest little thing. But when he does that for you, something is strengthened in your identity with him. And that's what he's working on. He's, he's building, he's strengthening the tie, the awareness, the consciousness, the, the conviction, the sense of purpose that is written over our lives. And he does that as we become free to dream. The, the ultimate expression of the Christian life is not you doing everything he commands you to do. Eric, once again, dealt with this so well this morning. The, the, the evidence is that our dreams are consistent with his dreams. And he delights himself to empower the fulfillment of those dreams. It's at those times. See, I didn't raise my kids to call me whenever they have a decision to be made. No, think, think about this. My, my goal as a parent was not so they would call me and say, I don't know, Dad, we're struggling. We don't know if we should have tuna fish for lunch <laughs> or if we should have fried chicken, you know. We really don't know, don't know what to do. We don't, God, Dad, we don't know if, if God, Dad, saying, yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry. Dad, we don't know if we should buy this car or buy that car. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm into giving as much help and assistance as I can. But it's not a sign of maturity for them to need my input for every decision. It's actually a sign of immaturity. 